Welcome to the autumn term list of providers updates briefing. This is a totally new format for us and I'm glad that you've logged on to join us at some point uh, while these slides are available to you. As I've just said, this is a totally new way of doing things, so it's new for us and for you. If we do make a mistake, please bear with us. We will continue. Um, <laughs> we would do that if we were in a face to face meeting with you anyway, so you're used to us being a bit stuttery at times. But we've got a lot of information to pass on to you today, and I'm delighted to say that you'll see a few of my colleagues. I've got with me today Carolyn, Amanda, Dina, Alison and Sam. So hopefully you'll see some new faces and you'll be able to put faces to names as well, which is always really good. Um, we want to say to you that these briefings are for childminders and they are for managers and for leaders in settings. Why we do them is to bring to you all the updates that we have around local and national developments that we think will be useful to you and will inform you in your practice. What we don't do here is we don't regurgitate all the stuff you've had in a broadcast. The reason we don't do that is because you've had that. <laughs> so this is about other stuff um, that's important to you as a leader in your own settings. What we're going to do now is talk about what's working well, what we're worried about and what do we need to do next. What I've just realised is I've made the first mistake and not introduced myself. So for anyone who doesn't know, I'm Christina Lewis and I'm the head of early years and childcare um, and hello to you. What we're doing, what's going well at the moment is that the take up rates for the funded entitlements are recovering and they are back to the pre pandemic rates. This is great. It means a lot of children are now back in settings, accessing their funded hours, benefiting from the safety and from the development opportunities that you provide them with. So thank you for that. What we're worried about is national issues around recruitment and retention of staff in the early years sector. And from my interactions with a number of you, I know this is a concern for you as well. And from my interactions with the DfE, it's a concern for them nationally. But later on today in this session, Amanda will talk a bit more about what we're going to do in Suffolk to address this. And what's next? Well, you will have heard that the Chancellor announced that we are going to be getting some additional funding into early years that will come through to you. What we don't know yet is the detail. I really appreciate you need to know the detail because you're planning your budgets for next year from March. You know that wages are going up, but you don't know what your hourly rate is going to be. I do appreciate that dilemma, but we don't know either at the minute. As soon as we get detail from the DfE that is telling us exactly what it is we're going to be getting in Suffolk, we will publish that change and get it out to you just as soon as possible. To move on, I just wanted to show you a little bit about the baby ant that we're offering. We're doing this in conjunction with our educational psychology uh, colleagues, and it's a, a tool for you to use alongside an educational psychologist, and it helps you to see what the additional needs are of children when you're struggling um, and when you're not quite understanding what the needs are and how best to respond to them. In case you're not sure if it's for you, you will have seen this in the broadcast. You will have seen there's an opportunity here for us to do a trial and for you to get involved in that pilot. But in case you're thinking, I don't know if it's right for us or not and our children because I don't actually know what it is. I don't understand. I fully appreciate that. So there's just a link there for you. It's about a 15 minute YouTube clip and it tells you what it is and what you can hope to get out of it and what you can expect about the benefits to be for you, for your staff and for your children. So if you're interested, but you're not quite sure, please take a time to look at that. So I'm now going to move on and I'm going to hand over to Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you. We just want to draw your attention to some of the latest updates in the key documents that you use. Um, Starting with some, like the statutory framework, there have been a number of different versions over the months and last year and it's worth checking that you have the latest. You can see here that this one was last updated only on the 3rd of September 2021. Um, sometimes you have only very minor changes but it is important that you are able to refer to the most up-to-date version. The next document, Inspecting Safeguarding in the Early Years, you'll see here was updated at 
the end of August, 24th of August 2021. And this has been revised to keep it in line with the new EYFS and the document Keeping Children Safe in Education. There is a reference in here because it relates to those other two documents, a uh, reference to sexual abuse and sexual harassment. And in the early years, we're looking at how children are protected and made to feel safe and then to respect themselves on each other. That links very closely with our PSCD. The thread really around children's wellbeing is running through all the documents. Um, and we're looking at, and often we'll be looking at how children's resilience and mental health is supported. And that is, that is really, really high up. And likewise, um, with the COVID, they want to know how children have been impacted by the COVID, how their wellbeing has been impacted and what practitioners are doing about it. Um, over the last year, the Early Years Service uh, led some uh, sessions, evening sessions on emotional wellbeing. And we can rerun those if you're interested, so do let us know. <coughs> Excuse me. So another document that's been updated is the Ofsted um, Early Years Inspection Handbook. And you can see here that that was updated in September. So paragraph 96 is a key one, and that relates mainly to assessment and the expectations around assessment. It's saying that Ofsted inspectors will not spend time analysing the data that you have and the first time materials that you have, but more how you're using assessment to um, influence where you plan and support children. And that's really, 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 really clear there that they don't want paperwork to be burdensome. The next two paragraphs relate more to exemptions, and that's quite rare in a setting, but if you, if you offer some very specialised provision, then you can have a look at those in more detail. A minor change um, I've put here, paragraph eight, is clarification that the fact that offset inspectors will be on site for the inspection, but some of the preliminary work and maybe post work will be done via the telephone and video link. That, that's to minimise contact in setting. And the last point there, Annex A, is around a setting that has been met. They won't be getting a recommendation, but they might get some advice as to what they want to do next. This one you might recognise, but it's just to let you know that the Ofsted poster, the one that you put on the parents' notice board, has been updated again, and that's the 24th of September this year. So have a look at that, print that off if you need to, um, and have that available. On the right-hand side of this slide, I've put myth-busting, because in the past, Ofsted used to produce documents called myth-busting. Um, they still produce a newsletter, but it's not called that. And I think you find that's really helpful. I've put the link there. And um, there are some examples of the types of things that might be included. It's almost like a frequently asked question, but it does, does help clarify certain things and, and definitely worth a look, I think. OK. Ofsted restarted their inspection um, in the summer term last uh, this year, sorry. And we've had 50 reports published in Suffolk up to November this year. It's comparatively small numbers, so we're going to spend the next couple of minutes looking at the trends that are coming through nationally. I've got a couple of slides on these. Um, these, as you can see, go from May to September 2021, which is prior to the new EYFS, but I think they very much fall in line with it. That's, that's my observation. And you've got um, 10 key themes that are, I'm sorry, 10, eight key themes that are coming through in reverse order. And in eighth place, uh, routines, how staff and routines are organised. You can see that there. I'm wondering if that links in with the care that uh, providers have taken over the last year to keep, you know, the health and safety um, elements in practice going and um, being really keen on routines. Number seven, safeguarding knowledge and practice. I'm surprised it's quite low down because I know, you know, we, we worry about that, you know, quite rightly so. So that's down there. It is a trend. It will always be a trend probably because it's something they focus on very closely. Um, in sixth place, curriculum intent and implementation is there. That was first really brought forward in the inspection handbook that came out in 2019 intent, implementation and impact. So I'm not surprised to see that coming through and you'll see that that's reflected in other documents too. In joint sixth place, it's organisation of teaching opportunities. So it's not just understanding the curriculum, it's how you're going to be using it to support children's ongoing learning. So 
um, those two you can see that they are in joint play. Quite high up on the list is observation and assessment, and I think that is a reflection of the fact that assessment has become burdensome for, for many practitioners in the past, and this big change with the new EYFS is trying to address that. So Ofsted inspectors are focusing on that to try and support providers to make those changes, and I don't believe it has to happen overnight, but it's a case of, you know, what are they doing, how are they making those changes, and how are they bringing it up to date, really. Um, linked in with that, I just remind you that we have put quite a lot of new information on Suffolk Learning around assessment and there will be new information coming on very soon and I would sort of urge you to have a look at that because, you know, it, it provides some very good guidance. Joint fifth place, parents and carer partnership. And I think a part of you know, keeping children safe during the pandemic, it was restricting and limiting parents coming into the settings. And I think what Ofsted are hoping to see here is, you know, in understanding that that had to happen, is what other steps have you taken to keep parents involved and provide information to them? So that's just my take on it. Um, and I have to just say at this point, the, the themes of I've put through here have actually been put together by the Early Years Alliance and Early Years Fundamentals, but I'm just giving you my take on it. Adult child interactions are important and it's interesting to see how high up that has come. And I think it's around ensuring that um, children have a maximum opportunity to engage with the adults that support them. Um, again, this links with assessment, a reduction in the amount of time taken for paper exercises. Management of staff coming through strongly in the new EYFS, and it's interesting to see it here, and I wouldn't be surprised if it links with continuous professional development, supervisions, and things like that. I don't have the detail of that one. Planning and lack of challenge links again with the curriculum. And it's interesting, isn't it, that you may have children who you feel are progressing well and certainly with the expectations for their age, but are you making sure that they are having the opportunities to reach their potential and maybe pushed a little bit further? So I think that's going to be something that comes up again and again. And in first place, curriculum knowledge and delivery. And um, that was set in the expectations of the handbook 2019. And it's important, isn't it, the responsibility as a setting to ensure that your staff do have access to the training available and, and do actually know um, the curriculum and the educational programmes that are in the new framework. This slide is um, linking to inspections that have taken place since September, so since the, the revised EYFS has been in place, and it links with good and outstanding judgments. And in those, it says, uh, relates to staff managing the curriculum well. So you can definitely see the theme coming through here. And leaders and managers being ambitious and able to improve the quality of provision. And that takes us back to the learning walks and managers knowing what is happening and, and wanting to provide the best. Linked also in the good and outstanding reports was performance management and um, not being sharply enough developed. So it, it might be that, uh, Practitioners have attended training but haven't really done very much with that or haven't followed that back up in the setting. There, there's all sorts of aspects of that. And practitioners do not always follow through planned activities well enough to ensure the learning intention is fully met, really. I think that's an interesting one because it feels like it's in conflict with following the child's interests. But if I can use a very basic example, it might be around the clarity of what your intention is. So if you have an intention for a child to be supported with their manipulative skills, you might have planned to do a marble run with them. Actually, the child's not interested. So what you do is you keep the learning intention, but provide another opportunity for manipulative play. So something like Play-Doh. That's my, my understanding of that. And now Amanda's going to explain some of the trends that we've seen in Suffolk. Thank you, Carolyn. Yes, following on from, uh, from talking about Ofsted trends, what are these emerging trends we're starting to see in Suffolk? We use the word emerging because, as Carolyn told you, there's only been, um, by the 1st of November, 50 reports published in Suffolk. Many more had happened, only 50 published at that point. And obviously, inspections are occurring all the time and are being published all the time. So the trends may change, or indeed, it may become more obvious that they really are concrete trends. So what are we seeing so far? 
in terms of safeguarding, we are seeing uh, recommendations and actions around safeguarding really on these two points. Firstly, the importance that all staff, not just the manager, um, that or not just the childminder, could be the childminder's assistant, obviously, as well, but that all staff are really needing to understand and be able to demonstrate to Ofsted their understanding of the safeguarding policies and procedures. Obviously, you have your policies, and as we know, there are there are Suffolk procedures. Uh, in terms of reporting things and in terms of the forms and those those elements which you have to follow and obviously the Suffolk Safeguarding Partnership is key for that. So as well as ensuring that your staff are really confident on policies and procedures around safeguarding, the other thing that's coming through is the importance of notifying Ofsted. So this is both with significant incidents or issues that occur that you absolutely must inform Ofsted. And if you've got any doubt as to whether uh, what occurs is a significant incident, then check with them. The other thing is to report those required changes, which, which are listed on page 40 to 41 of the EYFS, and that's 3.78. So just familiarising yourself with that list, remembering where it is, so you are reporting to Ofsted those things that you need to, be it new members of your committee, be it changes to your setting, there is a whole list there for you. The other trend we're seeing, echoing a lot actually of what Carolyn has commented on nationally, is in teaching and learning. So we've got both uh, positive comments mentioned around this and indeed also some recommendations and some actions. So what do you need to know? Learning really needs to be meaningful and matched to those children's needs. So it's got to be really, really knowing those children and knowing where they're at. So a robust key person system has, has got to be in place. So all staff really know those, those children, particularly the, the key person, key child relationship. And that also staff are confident to differentiate, to amend and change activities to meet those individual children's needs, stepping it up, stepping it down. And that understanding of child development to really know where that child is at and what that means. So that's, that's a really key thing coming through. Also intent, uh, again echoing back to what Carolyn said around the curriculum, that staff are confident to know what they've put out, what experience they're providing and why and how it's going to meet those individual children's needs. Um, that's something that, that we're really seeing coming through. And also the words challenge and extending learning, really building upon what children know, what they need to practice, what they need to learn next. The other thing that's coming through is partnership with parents and carers and how that supports home learning. And there's been some fantastic comments about the, the amazing work you've done in Suffolk supporting parents with learning through COVID. And it's lovely to see that coming through in the reports. And uh, it's something Ofsted will continue to look at. So you just want to be sure that you are um, continuing. You may have adapted how you do it, of course, now children are back in setting, but continuing to support with home learning for parents and carers. So moving on to the next slide, my final slide on emerging trends in Suffolk. We're seeing things coming through around leadership and management in several inspections, particularly the importance of supervisions. Um, as you know, you have to provide supervisions for your staff and as a manager, you too will need to have supervisions. Um, and as well as obviously developing staff, supporting staff in monitoring their performance, in ensuring that they are best serving their, their key children. They're also an opportunity to support well-being of staff and that's something that we are seeing Ofsted mentioning. Um, I mentioned the importance of a manager having a supervision too and this seems to be um, a, an issue particularly in committee run settings where it's sometimes more difficult um, due to the nature of the setup and the governance of the setting uh, but as a manager if you work in a committee run setting you do need to have supervision too so you may want to be liaising with your committee about that if that's not currently occurring as to how you can move that forward.
Professional development, CPD, again, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, in terms of national trends, we're seeing this in Suffolk too, and the importance not just of going on a course, but of a real programme of developing professional development. So, you know, you're not just doing a course, but what you're learning from it and how that's embedding to support the setting and being cascaded down that ongoing cycle of professional development and a real culture of learning. And finally, staff deployment, which again is echoing back into those national trends around routine. Um, it needs to be effective to really support children's learning. And the, the, the sorts of things we're seeing will be perhaps in that transition um, from, say, snack to another activity that are staff deployed effectively to really maximise learning opportunities through that time or ensure children are engaged and, and not sort of wandering and waiting. And likewise, if you've got a large group activity, how staff are deployed to support the children within that or indeed provide smaller group activities. I'm now going to hand back to Carolyn. OK, this is um, an opportunity for you to access new and different resources, but I'd like to provide just a little bit of a background. Um, we know and recognise that during the COVID lockdowns that this has impacted on children and you know, their development and the particularly effect of the youngest. So we've been working with a number of group settings uh, on a project we've called Off to a Good Start. And these are settings that offer baby provision. And we've been working alongside them to provide additional support on specific areas of learning and development. But alongside that, we've actually been able to, to organise training provided by KCA Five to Thrive. That's really, really interesting, good uh, national company that provides training. But also, we have purchased the license, which means any practitioner in Suffolk like yourselves can access their online resources, they're downloadable, and um, they're useful, they're information you can share with each other, with the, your, your staff in your setting, with parents. But you need to log on to um, the website and follow the links that we've provided here. But I would sort of urge you to have a look because it's different, interesting, and very relevant to the current time. <clears throat> now, the Early Years and Childcare Service have also revised and developed new resources for you. And you can see here at the top, Transforming Behaviour Guidance and Resources, really useful, really helpful on Suffolk Learning. And I would suggest you have a look at that if that's of interest to you. Also coming is some um, information around transition. And this is transition in the wider sense, so transition at different points in a child's life. Now, there's a lot of detailed and interesting information there. I think it's very accessible, but it's been broken down into sections. So you can focus on the section that is most relevant to you at that time or most um, pertinent to, to what you're thinking about. And you can print off or read a section rather than doing the whole lot in one go. Um, we've also been looking at early mark making and over the summer, this was be this has been devised as a target support meeting, and they've been run and very well received. It's around supporting children's early physical skills and um, skills in mark making and literacy. There is one more session planned at the moment, and I would suggest that you book online, have a look at the blurb on CPD online, and book uh, if you'd like to attend. And I think the next slide shows us the date, which is the second of December, and it's an evening meeting. And that's me for now, so it's over for Dina. Hello, I'm going to talk to you about the Early Years Foundation Stage Profile. As you know, the Early Years Foundation Stage Profile is a statutory assessment and it's completed at the end of the child's time in the Early Years Foundation Stage. So for most children, they will be in school and that will be at the end of their reception year in school. Um, but it is, as I say, statutory for any child who is in receipt of government funding. So some of those children might still be with you because compulsory school age is not until the term after a child's fifth birthday. And some uh, parents choose for their children to remain in the private, voluntary and independent sector until that time. So what would you what do you need to do if you know in the summer term that you have a child with you who's going to be five on or before the 30th of August 2022 and is receiving the majority of their early education free entitlement with you, then you will need to complete the profile. 
it needs to be submitted no later than the 30th of June. Now, as I said, most of you this will not apply to, and it's quite a way ahead. The reason I thought we'd flag it up this early, though, is because for the last two years it hasn't applied because the earliest foundation stage profile wasn't submitted uh, uh, to government um, during those pandemic to to loons during the pandemic. But the, the, as far as we know now, it is the plan that in uh, the summer term 2022, it will need to be completed. So we will be in touch with you uh, much nearer the time to ask you if you think you have any children for whom you'll need to complete the profile. And if you do, we will provide you with the information and the support you need. So just an early heads up that this might be coming your way if it applies to children in your setting. OK, and moving on to talk about the uh, a little bit about early years workforce development, a big thank you for those of you who completed our training survey. We sent that out and we got over 200 responses. Um, it was a short survey and you gave us so much really valuable information. We have sent an email out to all providers giving giving you the feedback um, and our, our response to what you told us. We're going to use the information you gave us to plan our training offer going forward. And one thing that came out of it really, really strongly for us was how much you valued the virtual training offer. Um, we, we implemented that because we couldn't do face-to-face -face training during the pandemic. And an outcome was that actually a lot of you really, really like it for an, all sorts of different reasons, for the convenience and uh, because it means, you know, you don't have to do long journeys. It's much more accessible. So we are going to carry on with that. In between September 2020 and August 2021, we delivered well over 300 virtual training sessions and we had just short of 3,000 bookings. Now that is a testament to the commitment that you all have to continue to continual professional development and I just think it's truly amazing the commitment of our early years workforce at times when there has been so much on your plates. So uh, a huge thank you to that and we'll carry on doing our best for you. We've had a few mentions of safeguarding. Um, it is, as we all know, really important that everybody's safeguarding knowledge is up to date. One way of doing that is attending training. And uh, we do have an e-learning option, which many, many people have found, again, far more accessible. But uh, I'm flagging this up now because the course code has changed for that and you've got the details there. So do please have a look and uh, book yourself onto that course if that's something that, that you need. We've also got some spaces on our skills for new leaders virtual classroom, managing and motivating staff and the details for that are on this uh, slide as well. So early years workforce development contacting us, please do get in touch if there's anything we can help you with or if there's anything you think we could do differently. We'd love to hear from you. Look as well at our Facebook page. We try to keep that uh, up to date with interesting information for you. Thanks. And I'm going to hand over now to Amanda. Thank you, Dina. I'm just going to talk um, a bit more about recruitment, which Christina mentioned in her in her opening address. We know, as Christina said, that this is a real problem nationally. And we're also hearing from you and we are aware that it is also a problem in Suffolk. So the, the picture that we're hearing from you is that we have several areas in the county where we are low on childminders and we have many of our group settings who are struggling to recruit to a range of different positions. Uh, we know it's really important that we have a, a mix of provision available across the county so parents and children have a choice to access the, the best care that most suits them. So this is a really key issue. The sorts of things we've been hearing around recruitment is it's threefold, really. We're hearing from you that there is a shortage of applicants when you are advertising for roles. We're hearing that when you are interviewing and applicants reach you or when you're shortlifting, shortlisting and applicants uh, apply, that the skills you're seeing are not always the skills that you need for those roles. The other thing that we're aware of is that there are some issues with um, with retention that perhaps people are moving out of early years um, 
be that that they've been in there for a while and want to change or be it that they've not long been in the sector and are moving out. So three issues really that we are aware of and there may be other elements which you can share with us. We're very keen to work in partnership with you on this. It's not a quick fix. It's not a straightforward one. If it was, we wouldn't nationally be um, have the concerns that we have around it. So our, our approach at the moment is twofold, really. In the short term, we are putting together some resources to try and cover all of the stages of recruitment to support you. And we aim to put these on Suffolk Learning next year. Um, we know that across the sector, we have some people who are very experienced in recruitment, have very successful programs. And we know that there may be some of you who perhaps haven't needed to recruit for a while. So perhaps may not have that same skill set. Um, and hopefully the resources will be useful to you in terms of covering all of those elements to try and maximize your chances of reaching the best the best people for for those roles in terms of the long term we are liaising with colleges in suffolk we're liaising with colleagues at job center plus department of working families and pensions and also with um our skills team within the council to try and investigate the barriers and hopefully some ways forward to encourage more people into the sector moving forward. If you have some ideas that you'd be keen to share with us around this, some success stories or some elements that would be really helpful, if you could please contact your advisor or worker who you normally work with, who normally supports you, and they can pass that on to myself and potentially I can get in touch. Thank you. Moving on to the next slide now. Thank you. It's the time of year again for the Suffolk Childcare Sufficiency Assessment 2021. And uh, as you may know, it's part of the local authority's duty to ensure there is sufficient childcare wherever it is practicable. And part of the, part of the way we do this is by producing the uh, childcare sufficiency assessment. And we run this from December to December. So we're starting to put that work together now and it will be published in the new year. And this helps uh, us report upon identified gaps in the childcare market. One of the really helpful things for us is parental um, input really into this. So this is our third year of running a parent survey to get their perspectives on childcare. And we really, really need your help to spread the word to get as many parents as possible to fill in this survey, be they parents already in your setting or parents who have just left or parents who may be about to start. Uh, you can see the link below. That takes you to the Suffolk Childcare Sufficiency Assessment page and the link for the survey is clearly on that, but it does close on the 8th of December. Uh, we, we put this in the broadcast so you can look back on that to get this link or you can just use a search engine and type in Suffolk Childcare Sufficiency Assessment. It will get you to this page where the survey is. So we'd be very grateful, please, if you could circulate it as widely as possible. And I will now hand over to Alison. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm just going to give you some information around the new Suffolk Learning uh, platform that we've got. We've transferred all the data over the summer um, onto this new platform, which we're really pleased with. We think it's much easier to use. Um, but just a reminder, this is a platform for childcare providers. Um, it's not for parents. All the parents' information is via the Suffolk County Council website. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention is the broadcasts. Um, we have been um, notified in some cases that some providers aren't reading the broadcasts. Um, I just wanted to let you know why we produce them really. It is to keep you updated with information and messages um, and to give you any deadlines for um, any funding um, claims that are approaching. So we do produce them with you in mind to try and give you the information that you need. Um, hopefully um, you do receive them. If you don't receive them, please let us know. We do send them out to settings and to portal users. 
Um, so please do get in touch if you think you're not getting them. But we also do publish them on the um, Suffolk Learning site. Uh, the other fairly new thing I just wanted to alert you to is the IAA referral process. Um, this has moved to a survey style form, um, so no longer a Word document which you have to submit by a secure email. So it's all done via the uh, survey, which the information is again on uh, Suffolk Learning on the referrals page there. The link is at the bottom of this slide. So this is for you to request any support that you need with an individual child who attends your setting or any other advice for your setting. Um, the survey will ask you the questions and take you to the relevant um, options as you work your way through that. We do advise that you read the guidance notes um, in advance of completing the survey. Um, the guidance notes will give you the questions that you're going to be asked so that you can be prepared and you can save a copy of uh, the questions and complete that if you want a local copy, which then you can just copy and paste into the survey um, if that's what you would like to do. But we always recommend that you do read guidance notes, which we do produce to help you and they are updated regularly. Thank you. I'm going to pass over to Sam. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, so I'll just be going through some funding information for you all. Um, so firstly, we just wanted to remind people if they're not already aware that we are a very small funding team. Um, it is just myself and my colleague Charles. Um, so if ever you uh, email into the provider portal inbox, it's usually one of us two who does reply to you. Um, and with that in mind, with it being such a small team of just the two of us, our workload is normally very high, especially around um, headcount tasks. Um, and in particular this term, it's been quite challenging. Um, and that's mainly been due to the two year old checker not being used as we intended. Um, so a lot of the checks being run by providers or so by the portal users were done when the headcount task was open. Um, so this meant during the 10 working days that the task was open, we had over 800 assisted applications that both Charles and I had to manually process. So that is quite quite a lot for just the two of us. So then that obviously has a knock on effect that causes delays to our processing times for, for other aspects of the funding. And also it delays um, your portal users themselves. If we've got a massive backlog to get through, um, then it's not necessarily going to be approved as quickly as you might like. And as such, you then won't be able to continue on claiming on your task because you're waiting on an approval. Um, so going forward, we'd like to just remind um, all the portal users that you, you can complete a new two year old application at any time. And we would encourage you to do this before the task opens as that that will decrease your waiting time, perhaps, and it will also definitely decrease our workload during that period. Um, and also it has other benefits such as the start dates on your two year old funding applications will be more accurate um, and things like that. Um, I'll discuss a bit more about the two year old funding briefly uh, in a little bit. Um, the other thing we wanted to mention from a funding standpoint was that there has been quite an increase in errors this term um, and sorting these out does also add to our processing time and can delay things such as the funding getting out. Um, so some of the common processing errors that we've encountered this term, if I could get the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so some of the common errors that we've been experiencing, um, particularly this term, obviously with the new two year old checker, um, either portal users not using it correctly or not using it at all. Um, and then other things such as claiming for the, the wrong number of weeks or the wrong type of hours. Um, this is quite common in, in over claims where two or more providers are claiming for the same child and they either claim for too many hours or or just the wrong type of hours. Um, adding incorrect date of birth to your task. Um, again, this causes delays. We have to chase up when we're processing to, to check if the date of birth is correct as it usually conflicts what's in our system. Um, and then this is also prevalent in the high need funding and the inclusion claims. Um, we would encourage your SENCOs also to double check that date of births are correct before they submit as this can also delay the payments going out for those uh, fundings. 
Um, and then other things such as non-economic EYPP. Um, when you're claiming this for a child, you have to select a drop down on the task. So it's not checked for automatically like economic EYPP is. So this is for things such as child in care, child protection, et cetera. Um, and we've noticed that either providers aren't selecting the option or they're selecting the incorrect option when they shouldn't have selected it at all. So um, things like that. So the main sort of crux of our, our errors that we we find just tend to be attention to detail. So we really, um, yeah, we really would encourage you and your portal users, obviously, to double check the funding claims before submitting and just make sure all the information is correct. Um, and then also to follow on from that, we'd also encourage all the portal users and other members of staff as well, if, if it helps, um, to look at the guidance notes that are up on Suffolk Learning. We produce guidance notes around the headcount, around the checkers, the new two-year-old checker, as well as FAQs. Um, we've got, even got some video guidance for the two-year-old checker as well. So our, our guidance is quite comprehensive and it is updated regularly uh, based on when we have system updates and also based on your feedback as well. So we, we really would encourage you to check this guidance um, as a lot of the time a lot of the queries that are sent into us they can be quite quite easily resolved just by checking the guidance it's normally quite straightforward stuff um, so going back to the two-year-old funding process uh, we just want to remind providers that it is a two-part process so when i mentioned not being completed properly this this was kind of what i meant so the first part of the process is confirming the child's eligibility um, and we've got a nice flow chart for you here, which we hope is helpful. Again, this is in, in the guidance up on Suffolk Learning. Um, so this is the first part of the process where you are checking or the parent is checking that their child is eligible. Um, and obviously, as you can see there, you can go through all the different options. And then once you have your eligibility confirmed, you get a nice long reference number um, beginning with TYF. And that's where you then go on to part two of the process which is where you then link the child to your headcount task. So as you can see there in the screenshot, within the provider portal, your portal user will see in the two-year-old funding section, there's a nice button there that says link eligible child to headcount task. You click on that. Um, we are aware it is then a little bit long-winded, the process, but unfortunately we, we have no control over that. But you then essentially, you enter the reference number, you enter the child's details, and you click through the screens and that's what adds the child to your task. So you, you shouldn't be adding the two year old to your task manually. You should be going through running a check first and then linking them and then they'll be on there in the proper way and you'll be able to claim for them correctly. And just at the bottom there, we've just added some links to our guidance, <coughs> excuse me, which is up on Suffolk Learning. Um, and then lastly, just a little reminder for next term, we've got the early years census um, so as I said, this will be happening next term as it usually does. Uh, requirement for all childcare providers, and we will let you know more information and the timescales around this once we've had some more information from the DfE. So probably in January, we'll be passing that information along to you. All right, thank you very much. That's all from me. I'll now pass it back over to Dina. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. I'm really delighted to share some superb news with you. We are really excited to have received the National Association of Family Information Services Awards for the most innovative family information service in 2021. It takes a bit of uh, getting a tongue round, but uh, it's such good news because actually it's the second year running we've won this award. We won it last year for the uh, innovative way we supported families to access their childcare needs during the pandemic and of course you played the most important part in that. This year we've run it, won it in uh, a recognition of, of the work we've done with the Family Nurse Partnership and they support uh, young parents um, from uh, the birth of their child uh, onwards. And when the child gets to two, we've worked in partnership with them to make sure that that child can get a fully funded uh, early years uh, education place. Again, thanks to you for, for supporting us in that. 
And in terms of making sure that the quality and the understanding of those children's needs is as good as it can be, we've uh, worked with Dr. Stella Louie, who, as I think many of you will have known, ran, uh, wrote the uh, Schemas for Parents booklet. And we provided training for the family uh, nurse partnership staff, as well as for some of our own brokerage staff too. So um, those parents as well will receive one of those schema booklets so that everybody's working together to support the uh, two-year-olds in the best way they can. So really exciting news and huge thanks to you for offering those places to these children. So great news there. And uh, on that note, I'm going to hand back to Christina. Thanks everyone. So we're coming to the end now and thank you for sticking with us. Uh, I'm hoping there was a really lot of rich information for you in that. Uh, these are our uh, contact details. I've heard a lot of my colleagues say uh, throughout this presentation today, please contact us if you want to tell us something, please contact us to find out more. So here are our normal contact details all in one place for you in case you need them. It's just left for me now to say as I said right at the start, this is a new way of, de of delivering for us. We don't know if it works for you or not, so we'd like to hear from you. So please, if you could follow the link that we're going to put up in a moment, you'll get put through to a survey style. It'll be quick and easy, but we need some feedback from you about how did this work for you? What was good? What wasn't so good? Uh, how would you like it in the future? That's, that's what we want to hear from you now because we can only tailor it if we know what was right and what wasn't. Further, I do realise that this sort of format, whilst it gives you the opportunity to pop in and out, it gives you the opportunity to look at this whenever is suitable for you. What it doesn't give you the opportunity for is to ask any questions of us. So to address that, in the information you receive telling you about how to access these sessions, you will have seen that there is going to be a live question and answer session. So please, if you want to ask us anything or if you want to just join to hear what other people are asking, please do book on to come to that. We would love to see you. We'll be here and we will take any questions you have. So I want to thank my colleagues for their input today and I want to thank you for all you do for the children of Suffolk and wish you a good rest of your day. Bye. <laughs>